All right. I try to make it easy for folks to figure out if they're in the right session. So um, I'm going to talk about software patents and um, solutions for developers to avoid uh, patent aggression. Um, I'm not going to, you know, there's other ways that we could approach this issue, but this is a developers conference, so we're going to go at it from that way. Uh, I know that uh, as tinkerers, uh, we like to try to fix the problem ourselves, so I'm going to start with a little bit of background on how the software patent aggression problem got so out of control and kind of uh, large. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the precise threats are and the differences between the two uh, kinds of threats that we face. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions that are being discussed in the US where the problem is the kind of the worst. <laughs> and uh, one of those things that we export, sorry. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll go through what we can do as developers. If you have any questions about legal terms, like I've like an acronym is snuck in that you don't understand, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, but if you have like a, we're like, I know we should just troll the trolls at some point in the middle because like that's kind of, it's the neatest, tidiest, but not workable solution. And so um, save your ideas for other ways we could attack the problem until the end. So, okay, thanks. Um, so the big picture. Uh, I chose the bonsai because it kind of, when I think of code and like all the minute prunings and uh, shapings and the care and feeding, I, I sort of thought uh, of like a, a nice healthy code base. Um, and of course the last piece that um, anything delicate like that needs is protection. So we're going to talk about how uh, software patents uh, are killing our little tree here. So. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between patents, products, and ideas, which I think we probably understand in this room, but at some point, like our legal system um, forgot to figure out how this, these things are different. So um, patents originally were granted for physical uh, inventions, which they worked out pretty well for. Um, and it was to give you like a limited amount of time to gather materials and hire people to build your, you know, cotton gin or your new tractor or whatever. And for physical products, when you have to get like wood sent from one place and iron ore like mined from another place and then bring in specialists from another place, um, having a limited time monopoly might make some sense. It gives people a chance to like gather all of their materials together and then take their product out to the market. Obviously, for software, um, on a really good weekend with enough Red Bull, like you could have your product ready by Monday. So uh, the 20-year limited monopoly that the US Patent Office grants uh, doesn't really make so much sense as a grafting on. Uh, the other thing that's kind of different is that uh, a physical device, like if I have a hinge and you have a hinge, we can look at each hinge and we're like, yeah, that's a thing for making the door swing. It's very obvious that we are looking at like different iterations of the same thing. Not so for software, especially once you get to the way that it gets worded in a patent application. So, um, so you no longer have what we call a really good notice. Notice is you can kind of picture it as a fence. So when you've crossed over to infringing territory, you know. Um, and so with software, uh, I would guess that almost every piece of software we're using is infringing some patent somewhere. So, uh, and there were no fences. We just are using software. So, uh, so that's difficult. So, um, so we're not we're not granting patents on physical devices. We're granting them on something closer to ideas. Um, and in fact, they're not even necessarily finished ideas. Uh, this is a legal term, functional claiming, which means that you can get a patent for, I recognize a problem, I'm going to solve it on a physical device called a computer, and then, um, um, you know, with software. So that, you can see how the logic has gotten a little bit faulty, like it's no longer, like you didn't build a tractor yet, or, you know, or whatever it is. But, um, you say that you're going to solve a problem, comma, on a computer. And that is what's called functional claiming. And that started maybe in the 90s or so, and then sort of steamrolled because it's much easier to come up with ideas than it is to come up with actual solutions to problems, 
right? I have ideas all the time. Um, but uh, it would probably take me longer to write them all down. But if you're getting paid to write them all down, then, you know, that's a whole other jam. So um, what is currently patentable in the U.S.? Because once I get to this part, people are like, well, why don't you guys just make it illegal to patent math? And um, unfortunately, math is, well, fortunately, math is already not patentable. That it's just that the statute isn't enforced in a very helpful way. So you're already not supposed to be able to patent something that somebody else is already using. Um, and it has to be useful. Like, you can't say, um, I want to patent a unicorn trap. That's the, even the US Patent and Trade Office will not give you a patent for that because um, it's not useful. And you aren't supposed to be able to get a patent on algorithms. Again, this is that thing where it is comma on a computer, which is a physical device. So it's tied to a device. And so that's, you know, so we're granting patents for algorithms, comma, on a computer. So that's like kind of where the law is. Um, novel, like I said, you can't patent something that other people are already using. Uh, at least you're not supposed to. Again, the problem here is notice, like, um, if you, the USPTO will grant a patent on something if they don't know that it isn't new. So uh, you end up with this problem of making sure they actually understand what's new and what's old. Um, I'm pretty sure they're not reading Slashdot or combing through GitHub with a fine tooth comb, so they have some problems there on figuring out what's actually new. Um, lastly, it has to be non-obvious, so it can't be obvious to someone in the field. Uh, has anyone here ever made a basket? Okay. Um, so uh, you may have heard the phrase underwater basket weaving, which like conjures this image of someone in a scuba outfit, like for some weird reason making a basket, which sounds ridiculous. But uh, most baskets are actually made underwater. The basket is underwater, not the basket maker. So uh, for instance, if you were to try and get a patent for underwater basket weaving, they should say no, because that's obvious to someone who already knows about basket making. Same thing with software. If, you get, if you're trying to get a patent for something that should be obvious to any software developer, then you should not be granted a patent on it. Unfortunately, you have some problems as far as like, uh, the U.S. Patent and Trade Office understanding what's obvious. Some of that's the language that is used in patent applications, and some of that is the amount of time that they're able to have to look at each application. Uh, and then, as I said, it has to be useful. So no unicorn traps, no I fly with magnets, no mind control, no time travel. So uh, no one was going to patent those things, right? Okay. So good. Um, so measuring innovation. Um, a lot of times we hear the phrase, uh, this spurs innovation, or we're promoting innovation, or uh, we're in favor of innovation, we don't want to block innovation. And I think it's important to unpack that a little bit so that um, we understand what we're spurring or promoting or um, not blocking. And so uh, innovation, it comes from the Latin word for new. So it's supposed to refer to like a new idea or new product. Um, what we see a lot of times is people wanting to protect something that is just a new revenue stream, which certainly um, aggressing with your patent portfolio is a new revenue stream if you haven't done it before. But I think when we're, you know, when we talk about the desire to promote innovation and you have that warm, fuzzy, like adding to the grand total sum of human knowledge kind of idea, but the person actually means they just want a new revenue stream. When you hear the word innovation, I want you to maybe think about which kind of innovation we're talking about. So, um, the U.S. Patent Office uh, seems to think that more patents equal more innovation, which is tricky. Uh, they're kind of in a weird you know, position as far as that goes. That's the, those are the beans that they get to count. Um, and, the, and they do like counting them. So uh, 40,000 new software patents each year. And uh, that's, that's just in the U.S. There are, uh, there are similar, not quite as egregious, but similar um, exponential increases in patents in other places. Um, in Europe, it's a little different. You have to do a little bit more of a semantic dance to get uh, a patent on a software-related invention. 
but um, it's, it's not impossible that the, that the real goodies in the patent are actually software, but there's some hardware around it. Uh, so, two types of threats. There's, uh, so when we talk about patent aggression, that can come from sort of two different places. Um, the unspoiler alert, uh, I think probably everyone in this room knows these things. Uh, patent suits are costing us a lot of money. Um, in the US, we know it's, uh, it's like $80 billion, something like that, per year. Uh, we know that the activity is increasing and not decreasing. And uh, we know that those lawsuits are not spurring innovation, and we know that it's a pain in the butt. So the first type of threat is trolls. Um, I was in Norway last week. Uh, they love trolls. They love trolls like we love cats and puppies. <laughs> they put them in their playground everywhere. They have lots of stories. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, if it's you know a plaster cast um, welcoming you to a playground. Uh, when it's a non-practicing entity suing you for um, and, you know, money for your invention that you put your blood and sweat and tears into, not so much. Um, so the annual wealth loss from the non-practicing entity lawsuits was about $80 billion. And this was as of 2011. As I said, this number keeps going up. Um, some arguments that people would make is that uh, innovation happens somewhere else. When two companies sue each other, the losing company doesn't do the innovation, but the winning company is, is making the innovation. Uh, and we, that isn't true with uh, patent trolls. And it isn't even actually true with the uh, revenue. So they recoup about 90, or nine, sorry, 9% 9 of this $80 billion. The rest is just lost revenue. Products not gone to market, dropping stock prices, different uh, uh, diverted focus for developers and uh, company, uh, company officials. And so we're, we're, it's dropping on the floor. We're not getting those new innovations. Once you sue a company out of existence, the troll doesn't pick up their invention and bring it to the market. So everyone is clear with me on that so far? OK. Um, so here's that, that number with the patent suits per year. Um, and this is, uh, yeah. This is from patent freedom going up every year. Uh, and then the kind of target that is being looked at for trolls is uh, increasingly like users and adopters. In, in Germany, and I think in some other uh, UK countries, you have an innocent user defense. So you can't sue uh, the user of a technology. You have to sue the creator, which is great, uh, unless you have any users in a different country that um, will get sued. So if you're, if you're putting software out internationally, uh, patent trolls can't go after your German users and adopters, but they could go after your US users and adopters. So, um, you know, I guess you could just not send software to the US, <laughs> but, um, or anywhere else that, is, uh, that has a similar uh, policy regarding uh, patents which is, I'm going to get to in a minute, increasingly more countries are harmonizing with the US. Um, and then a little bit more about, I, I, couldn't, I was trying to find something that would make it fun, because um, this can be sort of a depressing talk. I give you guys a lot of like horrible statistics. But I thought the turtles were cute. So intellectual ventures, uh, probably the world's largest patent troll. Um, is comprised of 1,300 shell corporations that we know of. There could be more. Uh, and this, this produces some really interesting, um, and I mean interesting in the Confucian sense, kinds of situations. So um, there's one example of a fellow in Russia who is, you know, small software shop. He gets a letter from one company, letterhead, all of that, and they say, hey, it looks like you're using similar technology to us. Maybe you'd like to cross license just in case, because we have some patents on that stuff. And you know, it seems like it would be a good idea. We could do a little partnership or something. And so it was like a really nice letter, uh, considering, right? And then he got another letter uh, after a little while, having not responded to the first letter that said, like, hey, it looks like you're shipping software under some patents that we own. And we are going to sue you if you don't cross license. 
And they had a, a much higher amount that they were asking for, for cross license. So then he didn't respond to that one either. He got another letter from the nice patent troll that was like, hey, I just wanted to check in and see if you were ready to cross license yet. So this particular developer was like, this, I'm familiar with this kind of like, you know, um, coercion. So he tried to contact the FBI and say, I've been contacted by a racketeering organization, which is basically, that's like mob, like when the mob shakes you down for money. And the FBI is like, oh, sorry, actually all of those companies are legally incorporated in the US, so there's nothing that we can do. Um, I don't know if you paid, but I, I hope not. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, you know, so that's, that's intellectual ventures, uh, we think. Um, another example of what kinds of things can happen here is uh, Nathan Merwold, who's the CEO of Intellectual Ventures, he sits on the board of a lot of different companies. Um, one of his shell corporations sued a ton of different companies, including one that Nathan Merwold sits on the board of. That was noticed by the press and they said, oh, that's so weird. It seems now that Intellectual Ventures is suing a company that their CEO sits on the board of. So after that article came out, like within a month, that company was quietly dropped from the list of companies that were being sued. It seems that he was actually suing himself, but wasn't aware of it. So. Yeah, it's, uh, so you end up with a, like, a, a lot of opportunity for both uh, like evil intentional collusion and then also like, uh, you know, a lot of un, unchecked sort of just random, like so much suing that people are actually, he's accidentally suing himself. So, um, so that, is, that is one type of threat. That's the troll. Those are the companies that are not making anything. The thing that's, makes them tricky to fight, uh, we can't troll the trolls because they aren't actually producing anything. The way that a lawsuit on patents works is that first you send them a note saying, you're using our stuff. They're not using any stuff because they're not shipping any products. They're not sharing any code. They're not writing anything except letters. So uh, that makes them a, a specific type of nut to crack. Um, this next one is, these are companies that, uh, I made this term up, I haven't decided if I like it yet or not, but this is, this is for us, I am putting this in as a stand-in for proprietary software companies that are suing free software companies for anti-competitive reasons. So like Microsoft, when they sue a tiny company like TomTom, they certainly don't need the money, right? Um, I was, I, I actually considered calling them haters, but I, you know, I, I didn't know how that would come off on a slide. But um, these are, these are companies that uh, are suing because they want to put more roadblocks in the way of their competition. So, um, and that is a different type of threat. So, um, this is, this kind of threat leads to uh, trying to work around thickets like the MPEG LA thicket. Uh, rewriting code, uh, pulling features out. There was a, um, a volunteer who writes GIMP plugins and uh, got a note from Borland, probably some like young new person in their IP department was like, hey, it looks like you are infringing a patent. Like, and they're like, awesome, I'm gonna make a little extra money. And, uh, and so he just pulled it, he buried it. He like scrubbed it off the web as best he could. He put a note up on his personal blog that said, don't ever ask me about those plugins again. Uh, I've, I've destroyed them, they're gone. You know, it's so, um, so we don't get this other functionality that we could have used on GIMP. Um, when, we, when we had the, the anti-aliasing font was still in effect, you would have, you know, like your friend would come over, you told them, oh, I'm gonna show you this great new thing. It's a totally different operating system. It's free, it's cool. Uh, and you pull something up and they're like, oh, the fonts look kind of fuzzy and crappy. And then it's like, well, yeah, I mean, and you might have, you might have known why, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But uh, it makes, it makes uh, Linux not look as good when we had to pull little things because of patent encumbrance issues. Um, and it's obviously, it's, it's not fun to go back in and look at the legal side, figure out how to code around it and go back and forth um, when you may not have even gotten a letter, but you know a colleague has gotten the letter. So 
Um, so this, the, the strategic aggressor type of suits, the anti-competitive suits, um, create a different set of problems, a different kind of response. Um, like I said, it's a, a headache even if you don't get sued. So um, if you know that something is uh, being litigated and your company is also using it, you're probably kind of sweating it, right? Like even if you haven't gotten the letter yet. So you might, you might code around it. We did this um, with the file allocation table patents. Uh, after TomTom Tom got sued by Microsoft, uh, we are like, well, we better code up something different to use in Linux kernel uh, in, the main, in the main branch also. Even though we didn't get a letter um, that I know of. Sometimes those are secret. So, um, and then lastly, like, uh, when you see suits like kind of deep down in the stack, not like, one little cherry on the top of like a mobile device, but like, oh, you can't have rectangles. Um, that deters innovation. So it, even, if, uh, even if you do cross license, it makes the devices more expensive. And then it takes away time and focus and things like that. And you end up with stuff where it's like, oh, well, I guess we'll all just avoid that like pinch thing for a little bit. And then we'll put it back in, but implement it different so it, it works kind of more jerky. It's like, okay, so who is that helping? It's not helping us as users. It's definitely not helping us as developers because we have to code around stuff that is so deep on the stack that it seems kind of obvious for a whole strain of technology. So the anti-competitive suits are aimed at wiping out their competition or uh, scaring their customers into thinking, oh, I'll get sued or I'll get letters or my fonts will look crummy, all of these types of things. So, uh, that, is, that is the other type of problem. Uh, and these companies, this is, this is from my buddy Simon. He was going to present with me. I'll try and explain this. Uh, he said that when you worked at Sun, what would happen is uh, as you developed, you had to um, continually patent. And he said, you know, so you develop something, you patent. So like uh, once, you start, uh, once you start with this idea of like, oh, these anti-competitive suits, they're great, then your company starts to pressure the developers to write more and more patents. So they have more and more uh, things in the arsenal. Um, and so, you know, you keep writing, you keep writing. Um, oops. And so, uh, you know, if you get, especially if you get an economic incentive to write patents at work, uh, you'll see, like, as you start to do your Christmas shopping, like, all of a sudden, everyone has, like, 40 new ideas that are worth patenting. So, um, you know, not that I'm opposed to Christmas buying, Christmas gift buying or anything, but uh, you know, this, uh, this, again, it takes time away from development. It could be spent somewhere else, right? Uh, so that is a lot about why the U.S. is kind of a mess. <laughs> um, uh, so thinking a little bit more globally, uh, it's not really, you know, not all good news, but uh, I assume most folks, like, when you write code, you're not like, oh, I hope this gets used by me and maybe my roommate. Like, you want to see your code to go everywhere, right? Like, when, like, I think most of us would like to see their stuff being used all over the world. So that means you have to worry about other jurisdictions besides your own. Um, one of the things that can happen, like, it's, it's a lot to keep up with the policies and the judicial practices in all different countries. And a lot of times, both uh, an anti-competitive suit or a troll suit will rely on your need for certainty. Um, you get the letter, and the only thing that you can be certain about is if you pay. That's how they tell you what will happen. If you don't pay, you don't know what will happen. You could win. You could go to court and win. It would be expensive. Um, you, might, uh, you might be able to ignore them. Maybe they sent out so many letters that day they won't remember to get back to you. Unlikely. Um, but uh, they sort of are resting on this, uh, this need that you have for certainty. Uh, maybe you can play a little game where you try and get it to be heard in a different jurisdiction that you think will be more friendly to your cause. Um, but this, is, this can be tricky. Unfortunately, the courts tend to favor the frequent litigator, the person who knows their way around, knows all of the different legal precedences. And so if your company is getting sued and it's going to be your first time going to court, you should expect to be as clueless as a beginner usually is. So. The, it, it, that makes it very hard to get certainty when you go to court. Uh, lastly, I talked about the harmonization 
Uh, this one's also from Simon. You can see the S instead of the Z. Um, he's British. Uh, this is the Sydney Opera House. People recognize that, right? It's kind of like a worldwide famous landmark. All right. So um, Australia recently signed a trade treaty saying that they would uh, harmonize with, uh, with US uh, intellectual property statutes. Whenever you hear harmonize, you should be suspicious, right? Um, we've, uh, we've all kinds of harmonizing that happens, and it usually is kind of a lowest common denominator type of thing. But uh, basically, they sort of bundled up a bunch of things that Australia would like as a trade negotiation and said, well, we could do those things if you would be willing to harmonize your IP law with ours. Um, I don't know if they were trying to sell off kangaroo meat or what, but um, they, now have, uh, they now have software patents in Australia where they did not, like, or, or a system that uh, like recognizes software patents. They have, haven't written them yet, but they have promised to recognize the regime of software patents. So that means that as far as like, software patent aggression, like, the, the doors are open. Um, so this is the other question I always get asked like, as uh, a U.S. person when I leave the U.S. and I tell everyone all of these things and they're like, can't you guys fix it? And I, I wish we could. If it's, uh, this is the time when you kind of start thinking about the silver bullet solutions. Um, and if you think of something we ought to do that we haven't yet done, that would be awesome. But I'll tell you what the current thinkings are. Um, courts are kind of a black box. We could... Um, Hope to see more suits that would treat software patents a little bit differently and um, you know, uh, not recognize troll suits as valid lawsuits. That would be nice. Um, so far, our courts have been really, really super unwilling to do that. Uh, I think it's because the courts that actually hear patent cases are patent attorneys themselves who, um, who well, they like patents. They just, they, they think, Everything should be patentable, and um, and that uh, every every patent deserves to be heard, even if it is a troll suit. So, um, as far as uh, using the courts as a tool to stop patent aggression, uh, it's it's expensive to go to court, and uh, we don't always get the result that we hope for. Even even when we look at one, like we looked at Bilski a number of years ago, and we're like, oh, maybe the courts will, you know narrow the scope of patentability a little bit and say a little bit more about pure math not being a great subject for patentability and they chose not to. So um, expensive as I mentioned. Congress, you guys know this expression about how you like sausage is good but you don't want to see how it gets made? Right? Okay. So um, it's a uh, Congress exactly the same way, right? It's a uh, law making and uh, it also not cheap. Um, and even when they are willing to work, uh, we can't even really get them to vote correctly on school lunches, but um, maybe they could do sausage for the kids. Um, but uh, as far as legislative solutions, it's been very hard to get coalition around anything in the current Congress. Um, we uh, have also looked at policy change at the USPTO. Um, they, uh, they look at certain type, like certain categories of patents in a different way, and some of those solutions could be ported over or kind of tweaked a little bit to uh, make it so that some of the egregious stuff that we all would look at and be like, oh, there's no way that should be patentable, that those things could be uh, denied. So it's, uh, and I think this has good history. The, um, we like to think that everything in the software world has never happened before, but um, we saw patent speculation during the railroad boom. We saw patent speculation on farm implements before that. And uh, what ended up working was not uh, everyone going down to Congress with pitchforks and to, you know, a uh, asking for the whole system to be demolished and abolished. Uh, they looked at industry-specific reform that made it better. So policy change at the USPTO, they could treat software patents a little bit differently because they, I mean, it's not a tractor, right? Um, these are two specific legal definitions, written descriptions and definiteness. And they use these um, for bioinformatic patents. Written descriptions means, uh, that's a legal term meaning explain how you will actually solve the problem. 
as opposed to say I identified a problem and I'll solve it with software. So that's how that could look if we decided to do that. Um, and definiteness means that you actually say what is outside the scope of the patent. My understanding, a little, I'm not so up on the bioinformatics, but I, I think they want to make sure that you're not uh, patenting parts of people or uh, like gross unethical cloning practices and things like that with human beings. So they, they want you to really like say like this is what's in the patent and then these other things are not. Just so you know, I'm not trying to get Frankenstein here. I'm just trying to like, you know, nice new glass eyes or whatever. So um, we, could, we could port this over to software. And I think it would get rid of a lot of the more egregious software patents that we all know should not be in there. Um, another pair of eyes. This is a, they love how the government, they actually uh, use this, I think, as an acronym even, APOE. It's like, a, if anyone loves acronyms more than software developers, it might be government. But uh, this, this is basically just means you have a second person take a look at the patent application to make sure that it's not like, no, 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 that's just ridiculous. Just a second person taking a look at it. Right now, we usually have one examiner take a look. So, um, and then Obama, he actually uh, spoke recently about software patents and patent trolls. So that's more attention than this uh, issue has gotten outside of the technology community for a long time. Uh, I don't know if he'll be able to get anything done, but I'm going to talk a, a little bit about what he proposed. I, I also kind of like, who is his dentist? I want to know. That is the, like the nicest teeth on earth. Um, anyway, uh, increased transparency. So this is when the company actually discloses like who their real uh, corporate uh, headquarters is and doesn't just like, oh, company X and company B and you know, so you actually, uh, you, you would like to have it so that when you get a, lawyer, a letter from a patent lawyer that you know who that person is actually representing. Um, maybe the losers pay the litigation fees, so when you have a patent suit, um, this is also aimed at trolls. It means that, uh, so patent trolls, there's no, uh, there's, there's no disincentive for them to send out hundreds and hundreds of letters. Because the ones that the, the cases that they win far uh, far and beyond pay for the cases they don't win because the cases they don't win it's the cost of sending a letter. So um, making the losers pay the litigation fees means that trolls would be a little more strategic, I guess, about who they choose to sue, um, and they would stop bothering some of the um, companies where it's like a, a much looser claim. Um, and then lastly, uh, sort of letting the Federal Trade Commission go after trolls. So um, you can see like there's sort of a theme here, like uh, we had on the National Public Radio uh, had like two different shows about trolls. And um, in the US we have this, uh, we, we think we have this uh, enemy of people who don't work and, and trolls fall into that category for us. Like, so, uh, so there's a lot of energy around the non-practicing entity problem. So, uh, so all of the kinds of reforms that are on the board are bad for trolls, but they don't really cover the strategic aggressor problem. Uh, these are companies that have employees that, that do actually do things besides send letters. So um, out of all of the reforms that are being discussed uh, for, the, you know, for the patent system, um, we're not really going to get to the strategic aggressor problem. I mean, we might. It's possible. We might vote all new people into Congress that are capable of getting things done. But um, I, I think it's more likely that we, we won't. Um, maybe that's the pessimistic part, I guess. I used to be more of an optimist, I promise. Um, anyway, so <laughs> what can we as developers do? Um, so this is, this is from Simon. So this is, so this is a kind of a four-part thing. Um, these are all the patents that threaten your software. Uh, the first thing that you can do is use a modern software, patent, uh, software license that mentions patents specifically, that says, like, you can't just take my open source code and then patent it. You know, so that's, that's piece one. Um, you can also do uh, what we call like kind of a scorched earth. So you, you have your key invention, and then you sort of like scorch the earth around it with defensive publications. Um, and those are uh, cheaper to do than patents. It also gives you more coverage. 
the Open Invention Network, where I work, will help you write them if you are working in the, in the Linux and open source space. And this gives you uh, another layer of defense. Um, a non-aggression covenant, which is where you sign and say, like, I won't sue you if you won't see, sue me. We also manage that at the Open Invention Network. And then um, lastly, a patent pool, where you have patents that you can use for defense. And this is specifically targeted at the strategic aggressor problem. So um, the patent pool, where you have patents you can use for defensive purposes only, doesn't work for trolls, but it, it does work against strategic aggressors. Um, so strength through community, uh, that's the great thing about all of those solutions on the little pyramid graph is that we don't have to wait for Congress or Obama or uh, the, you know, anyone in government anywhere to affect that change. We can use those solutions today. Um, so just to recap, so I think we're closing on the end here. Uh, patent validity, uh, unfortunately, not important. Uh, you, you can get a letter whether that patent is good, mediocre, or just a big pile of crap. Um, it is a chilling effect on development. I'm sure everyone knows that. You chose to come to this talk instead of something technical. Um, your international customers can be sued, which sucks. And um, future intellectual property treaties could change the landscape so that a place where you thought you were safe uh, becomes no longer safe. So what you can do about it, we said, use a software license that mentions patents. Um, do defensive filings. We can, we can help you do that. Uh, join a defensive patent pool. My understanding is that there's some um, energy around an open hardware pool now, too. So um, our idea has uh, gone and germinated other ideas. And, um, and uh, OIN is also a, a non-assertion agreement where uh, we get companies to say, I won't sue other Linux companies. So um, if, you <laughs> if you decided this was fun and you like reading about this stuff, here are a couple of uh, papers that you can dive a bit deeper in on this topic. Um, those are all of the picture credits. And I would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Fix that was not mentioned uh, it, that if the U.S. Patent Office wouldn't be funded by the granted patents, then they wouldn't have that much in incentive to grant those patents. Yeah, that's another good policy change. I, uh, which I do sometimes mention when I give. I usually go deeper on the U.S. Patent Office in a non in a U.S. talk, but yes. Um, He's asking about uh, how the U.S. Patent Office is funded, and they get more money for granting patents than they do for um, uh, denying them. Uh, so, uh, and they also start from an assumption of validity. So the U.S. Patent Office is, uh, the, the deck is stacked pretty bad there if your goal is to see less dumb patents. Other questions? Yeah. Can patents be revoked easily? Can patents be revoked easily? <laughs> yeah, so can patents be revoked easily? Um, the, the shorter answer to that is that the earlier on in the process you can participate in telling them, like, no, that's obvious, um, the cheaper it is. So, like, the recent America Invents Act uh, allows for uh, community participation earlier in the process, like before the patent is granted. Because that means looking at the 6,000 patents that come through every week, um, or just the ones that are useful to you if you can figure out how to sift through them. Um, if anyone wants to uh, apply their awesome database uh, scraping skills to that problem, let me know. But uh, yeah, so pre-grant submission, a little easier to get involved because there's a portal and a, an opportunity. Usually after the patent is granted, you have to challenge it in the courts, which is, which is expensive. So. Yeah, so the, 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 the best plan is to get to them before they are granted. So. Right. Yeah, so peer to patent, which is my colleague Andrea is the um, mover and shaker behind that uh, process. So, uh, yeah, and that's, uh, so there is, there is opportunities, but it's, 
in terms of work and cost, the earlier in the process, the cheaper it is. Um, you should definitely go to her talk tomorrow at what time? Andrea is talking tomorrow more specifically about defensive publications and the pure patent process. So, cool. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, so, say you're saying is the the compulsory licensing? Is it uh, like why is it assumed validity or? Oh. Oh, interesting. So the, the question is, uh, could, like they have in the UK and the Irish system, uh, do what's called compulsory licensing? So if you uh, have a patent, but you're not working that patent, then you have to grant licenses for it. Um, that is, an, that is an interesting idea. I, there hasn't been a lot of conversation about that in the US, but that's another potential solution um, for the patent troll problem, which, um, yeah, I, I would love to see more on how that is uh, working here, because uh, obviously we, have, we don't have anything like that in the US, or we wouldn't have the troll problem we do. So, yeah. Oh, uh, oh, so no, we're, um, so we're pretty focused on community solutions for developers and generally don't get in on the lobbying game. Uh, but that's not to say that individual members don't do that. Um, but that's, we, we kind of said like, everyone who's in favor of non-aggression come in here and, and if that's like kind of the lowest common denominator we could get everyone to agree with. So we have companies that, you know, feel differently about uh, what would be the best type of reform to uh, stop undue patent aggression. But uh, what, we have, what we've focused on is getting people to stop suing each other and start, you know, talking about more things that might be in a common interest. So I hope I answered that. Um, is there any more over here, over there? Um, okay, so my email is dev at Open Invention Network. Um, if you want more on Pure to Patent and uh, defensive filing, go to Andrea's talk tomorrow. Um, if you want to email me, you can. I'm not a lawyer, so I won't give you free legal advice even over email, but um, I am happy to talk with you about more defensive publications or uh, joining the Open Invention Network. So thanks for listening.